Hey, Shane. Hey, KK. How's it going? Good. Just get my video going here. <clears throat> Perfect. Ah, oh, we have two guests already. Hello, hello. Hey, guys. Hi, hi. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. I'm indeed, Kenneth. Super. And I'm, I can share the video also. Just out of curiosity, which uh, company yes. are you guys with? We are working at the Department of Molecular Medicine in Denmark. Oh, wow. Hmm? Wow. What what time of day is it there? <laughs> the 10 o'clock. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's very light outside, though. <laughs> oh, yes. It does get very light, but I guess also in Canada, right? You're from Canada? Yep. yep. Sort of the same latitude, I guess. All okay. latitude, yeah. maybe. Yeah. yeah, it's our summer solstice. Well, summer solstice everywhere today. So, um, <laughs> oh yeah, it'll be uh, light out until about 10 p.m. I think at our latitude. Uh, yeah. Actually, when I was down in South Africa, the seasons were flipped, so this would be the fall solstice or whatever it's called. Yeah. Cool. That was so funny because I would left here with the buds coming out on the trees. I went there, and by the time I came back, all the trees had turned autumn colors and then i come back here and all the trees are in full bloom and it's like okay that's a little bit of a mind warp <laughs> very cool very cool hey tim how's it going long time no see oh maybe you can't hear me yet <laughs> uh, sunset for me is 9 54. there we go there we go hey mark good Hello. to hear your voice um oh. Let's see oh. who else is here. Uh, Josie Ann, and I think I saw Barbara. Is that Barbara Francois? And there's Tim Fennell, of course. Come in. See you, Barbara Huang from Genetics, uh, Life Labs. Oh, hey, Genetics. hey. Fantastic. Hi. Fantastic. Great turnout. Um, I think we'll give about another 30 seconds and then uh, we'll jump into agenda. Um, I'm going to be sending out a recorded link. So if anybody misses the first minute or two, um, and I'm really curious about any bits. There'll be recordings of the Zoom session going out so you can kind of review it at your own pace. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so let's jump into it. Um, first of all, thank you everybody for coming here. Uh, this is going to be a collaborative session. So um, Mark and KK are going to go through some scheduled topics. And then at the end, we'll have time. Definitely interrupt them as, as they go and as they work through. And at the end, we're going to have time for, we're going to open up the floor for some questions. The intention of that is for you to um, ask questions about some problems that you're encountering, ask questions about Clarity Limbs in general, whatever you want. And we'll try and trash some of those problems or some of those questions and kind of get you pointed in the right direction. Obviously, we've only got an hour here, so we're not going to solve every problem, but hopefully we'll give you, some, you know, help you out, get you pointed in the right direction. Uh, that said, I believe the first item on the agenda is a discussion on automated workflow tests. So I'm going to hand that over to Mark. Janine is coming in. Oh, okay. We'll give her a second. Ah, M for M&Ms, but also for minions. Hey, Mark. What? The uh, Janine's uh, avatar. She's got the M&M Smarties. I'm an well, old man. I could have. <laughs> yes, I love M and M. Actually, I went to the M and M store in um, the Mall of America, and it just made me so happy um, that I I bought one of the mugs. And Mark, you've probably seen me drinking my coffee with an M and M mug, but I bought one, and then I I got home from um, Minnesota, and I had to call the store and order the rest. I got every other color. I got all the colors. <laughs> Fantastic. They got you hooked. Uh, okay, workflow tests. So uh, actually, if people don't know who I am, I'm just going to uh, take 30 seconds. Uh, so Mark Lushnak, formerly of Illumina. Uh, before that, I was at Genealogics. Um, and so I've been involved in the product that's now called Clarity since 2007. Uh, I've helped a lot of customers write code um, with sort of code examples and application examples. Uh, and actually that sort of leads into the second topic. 
Um, but um, some background on workflow tests. So you, you might know them by a different name. We call them work, workflow tests, sometimes end-to-end -end tests. And traditionally what we've done is when we build a, an entire workflow for a customer, then as part of our sort of internal QA process, we also build an associated workflow test. And what that really means is that we're running samples from the beginning uh, right through to the end. We're checking that every step matches the specification. If there are you know, master mix calculations or normalization calculations that we are checking that the answers that the script provided uh, are what we expect them to be. And so obviously it saves a lot of time doing this uh, doing this manually. And obviously, if you're in, in a clinical or a regulated environment, you often need that uh, that sort of proof as part of your validation. Um, and I think the fact that they can be run more easily leads into the fact that they can also be run more frequently. Uh, whereas if you're doing this manually, the last thing you want to do is do an end-to-end -end sort of regression test. And so, you know, I guess the, the people, you know, are free to invent their own value. But for me, what's very useful is if, let's just say you've got two workflows, one of them is stable, it's in clarity, it's where your, you know, most of your samples are, are being run and it's validated. You're adding another workflow and you want certainty that essentially the new workflow hasn't broken the first workflow. Uh, and un unfortunately, I've seen this several times in reality where, uh, you know, a lab starts out with maybe a lab developed test and uh, there's, you know, th there's only two sample types, uh, blood and tissue. And so there's a drop down that says blood and tissue. And then for the, th for the, for the next assay, you know, you might add uh, another sample type and just that one change of introducing another entry into the drop down breaks a script because before it was scripted for if it's blood then do this if it's tissue then do this and there's there's nothing to catch the third uh, case so there's, there's many many cases for them and i say traditionally this is something that we've done internally when we build an end-to-end -end workflow but sort of hearing from customers and uh tim and Deneen, uh i'm glad you're uh on this call uh because i think you also have a, a view uh on this which i'd like to represent or or, rep or you represent yourselves is that they were, these these are valuable uh not just for semaphore's qa program but maybe customers would a like access to the tests and be able to run them themselves uh, B would like knowledge on how to create them or C, you know, maybe they don't want knowledge on how to create them, but they just wanted them created and they're going to, you know, incorporate them into their continuous improvement or continuous delivery pipeline. So I don't know if, if we can use a big grand word like an initiative, but one thing we're, we're sort of trying to do is, is to understand do customers think that these would be as valuable as we think they are? And if so, essentially, how do we um, get knowledge or product in front of customers so that, you know, if, if you want workflow tests, then you can have workflow tests. And, and we're, we've moved it from us running them on your workflow that we built to you being able to run and build them on workflows that you built and consequently support them. So um, that's essentially what we're trying to do. And I say to understand what uh, people want. Now for, for, for Tim and Deneen, um, you know, you, you already have some workflow tests, but it tends to be that it's us running them, you know, if we make a change to the workflow. But I say, I, I, I've, without sort of betraying any confidence to the larger group, you've asked about, you know, it would be nice if you could work, A, uh, build these yourselves and, and B, run them yourselves. And so have I captured your needs there? Is there anything that you want to add or disagree with that I've I've not got right or I'm not representing your views? No, it, um, this is Tim. 
I'm hundred percent behind the, the 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 automated testing. That's something Avro started, and before he left, we were supposed to get up with him to get copies of that so we could understand them and maybe run them ourselves as well. Um, we just you know we we've been kind of busy you you guys and us uh, with our to, to let the let the rest of the group it, know that. Um, We've taken Clarity Limbs and we've just, we scripted the, I'd say, I always say we scripted the crap out of it. <laughs> Everything, every um, piece of the workflow has some type of scripting on it. So we, we've tried to really, really customize it for our customer, or, which is a lab. Um, but it's it's a, been a black box to us the testing that you've done uh we've never seen it before um but like i say we've kept you busy enough and and we've been busy um and i, I would like to carve out some time where we could understand it and yeah. and do it so so i i, I do recommend that for everybody else cuz i i believe you guys have food as automated testing caught stuff that as we've changed stuff over and over as lab has always come back with changes. Um, I think you've it's proven it's worth. Um, I mean, you guys could tell tell me better because you guys are what been the ones that are running it. You know, has it been catching stuff for, for us, you know, for our workflows? Um, you know better than us, but yeah. It 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 definitely does, Tim. I would say that. Obviously, the, the the results you get from the tests are as only as good as the tests. So it, right. it it tends to be, you know, we we run the tests and let's say, you know, we we don't we don't give you any code until those tests pass. However, that doesn't mean that when the customer or the lab receives the code and the consequences of that, that they might say, okay, there's actually a mistake in the master mix calculation. And of course, if we don't know about that mistake, then the, the, the test will never catch that. So I don't want people to think that, you know, one, just because a workflow test passes that there isn't, it, it's a component of QA, but it itself is not QA. And, you know, it tends to be an iterative process. And I guess that leads into when, you know, if you want these tests, when should you do it? And I'm pretty opinionated here, so I'll, I'm happy to receive direction <laughs> from others. But I would say, you know, in, if you've got a workflow which is stable, and I say is validated, then it's a good idea to have workflow tests for that. And I had the analogy of you're building a second workflow. I would say there probably isn't much value in having workflow tests for the second one until it's stable, because you essentially it's going to, you know, each time you make a change on the new workflow, you're going to have to redo the tests. And essentially you are, I don't know what the, you know, doubling or tripling the quantity of work. It might be easier to, when the second workflow is stable, then build workflow tests for that. But nonetheless, while you're building the second workflow, you can be constantly testing the first workflow and just checking that you haven't broken anything. So to my mind, workflow tests probably give the most return on investment when the workflow is approaching stability, but not necessarily when it's in development. It's when it's in development, you want to be testing the others. But I mean, Shane, you have lots and lots and lots of software experience, sort of probably way, way more than I do. Kind of where do you feel that workflow tests fit in? No, that's probably pretty accurate. That's pretty accurate. And um, once things are stable and you want to lock down the requirements, build a set of Python based workflow tests, lock down and kind of be able to run and capture those requirements. They're also nice. Um, if you have other people like engineers um, updating the scripts that might not have the full context that the lab has of all the requirements, um, it means they can kind of jump in, make these software changes, just run the workflow tests and have a good instinct that hopefully the existing requirements that were captured haven't been broken. Um, so that's a, another really important use case for it. But Shane, the, the, we, we work for labs they have yeah. no notion of locking down requirements. <laughs> they, they say, what? 
Well, even even better, even better than because um, say if you have lab lab personnel making changes, uh, you can run the workflow tests and you can know that the old requirements that were captured in the workflow tests have been yeah. broken. It, it is, I mean, depending on how often you run them, it is quite not necessarily convenient because it, it's actually inconvenient, but it's quite good to be able to say, hang on, what whoever made those changes yesterday, inadvertently you've broken something over here. Can can we have a conversation? Whereas so it it at least prompts you to know that the conversation needs to be had, not necessarily what the outcome of the conversation is, though. The, the, the other thing I'd say is that the way Clarity works, there are some difficulties in doing these workflow tests, not as a concept, but specifically with Clarity. So the two areas uh, where it's hard to do workflow tests or, or to get them to work is if a script pops up a dialog box and is waiting for the user to click OK, the, that there is no user in this case it, it's automated test so essentially the tests will stop at that point so we have a couple of tricks for trying to a reduce um you know the circumstances in which that pop-up box would pop up uh, and b there's something we can do um to actually try actually trick the script into thinking it's being written it's being triggered from a button because if you remember if you trigger a script from a, a button, it doesn't produce a dialog box. It actually writes to the screen. Uh, so on the fly, we can trick a script into thinking it's been it's been triggered by a button, not by a screen transition. So that helps. Uh, probably also, as you know, there's a there's a couple of um, there's a couple of cases where Clarity doesn't have an API. Uh, so things around uh, the um, ice bucket, uh, as, as you probably know, you can't programmatically add or remove uh, controls. And as a consequence, you know, your tests might be limited because of that. So obviously areas where, um, where you know, there is no API, uh, then your test coverage might not be 100% of, of what you're doing, but we can get it pretty close. And I would say the, the the other thing I've heard from certainly from our developers, and I don't know if it makes sense to customers as well, but um, you know, if you do have an established uh, workflow, and let's say you want to make a change to a step which is like eighty percent into the into the workflow, what you might do is actually use the workflow tests to get samples to that stage, and then not run any further. So essentially, when you're ready to do unit tests on the changes that you're making, you can very quickly bring in samples with a known state. Uh, so known inputs, and you obviously should be able to predict the known outputs. So we talked we talk about them as end to end, but actually partial workflow tests to get things in the right state with with the right properties is, I think, something that we internally get benefit from. Shane, I don't know if that's you know, from your software experience, whether that's a, a valid use case or whether we're kind of just perverting the course of these tests. <laughs> it can be, it can be. It's they're definitely handy, handy tools for automating the interactions with clarity. Um, so however you want to use it, however your the necessity of your lab are, you know, whatever the necessities of your lab are, it makes you know, use it um and it makes sense. Uh the last part that I was just going to address is um I was going to share a couple of uh, resources so that people can be self-serving. All right. So one of the resources that we have here, I'm going to just briefly share my screen. Is um, can everyone see that? Yeah. So Semaphore has their own libraries. Um, these are um, open source libraries. They're well documented, and they actually have sections on workflow testing. I'm going to post after I close my screen. I'm going to post a link in the chat. Um, so you can go to this if you're, um, you can go to this, you can download the Simple 4 libraries, start interacting with your own Clarity server, uh, start writing Python scripts to automate your own Clarity server, and of course, write workflow tests. Um, so please check it out. It's a great resource. We've had many customers use it. We use it ourselves. We update it regularly. We think it's a very good resource and it's been downloaded thousands upon thousands of times. So please, please help yourself to it. Um,
So I'm just going to post that link there. And uh, that's it for me on workflow test. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I mean, we're not the type of company that says, you know, here's the documentation. We're just letting you know the documentation exists if you want to self-serve. And, yeah. um, you know, uh, Tim and Deneen, I, I, you know, given our relationship, um, when we're, we're not just going to put you with the documentation, we actually want to do, you know, sort of, the, the, that's the absolute minimum, but we, we want to surpass that. Right. Oh, you're back. I am. <laughs> I mean, I was listening the whole time. No, no, no. But you, you were quite definitely in the car. I was. <laughs> um, so, uh, Shane, can we switch to topic two, which is about the recent announcements? Oh, uh, Catherine, yeah. Hang on, you. I think you're on mute. Sorry, did um, I was wondering whether anybody else who um, hasn't piped up already has got any questions or concerns about what we've been talking about before we switch topics? Thanks, KK. I think we're good then. Um, okay. Please post it. If you come up with questions, please raise your hand, um, ask us at the end, or just post in the, the chat. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on to topic number two, which is a discussion of upgrading workflows to Clarity 6. Star. Uh, okay, uh, I'll let you guys take it away. Yeah, so I don't know how many people have seen this, and I say we don't, we we have a partnership with Illumina, but we, you know, it's not like we get much more advanced notice of this than, than you do. Uh, and actually, I think it's fair to say that we uh, at Semaphore have questions uh, and uh, about what this means. And perhaps you've had conversations with Illumina already and you know the answers. So please, please, you know, come off mute and, uh, and share if you have information. But, and Catherine is probably going to correct me because her memory is good and mine is bad. Um, but, so if I misrepresent this, I think there's been an announcement recently from Illumina that says approximately one year from now, uh, a lot of the Clarity versions which are currently supported are not going to be supported uh, and so that uh, obviously has consequences and I say we, we're, we're still getting to grasps with what that means so I, I don't necessarily think that we have all of the answers but uh, as I understand it come approximately this time next year uh, nothing earlier than 6.2 uh will be supported i think actually the, the press release says that only 6.2 will be supported but i think that's perhaps naive because if they release 6.3 then we would expect that 6.3 would be supported so um but yeah our un understanding is that anything less than 6.0 is is not going to be supported uh and uh there's with that there's also uh an associated operating system change which impacts some downstream tools so um i think currently uh, illumina supports uh red hat enterprise linux 7 and essentially the free version of that which is centos and actually, before I go so uh, too much further, uh, for Tim and Deneen, you guys are self-hosted. So this effectively, the, op the OS change doesn't apply to you. So if you're self-hosted, you can run this on whatever you know OS you want w within reason. Um, but we're planning on going to uh, we're planning on going to the cloud. Yeah. Okay. So that's so uh, yes. So it would be. Uh, so essentially, the the OS is switching from the Red Hat flavor to uh, something similar, which is Oracle Linux, uh, and the version number changes. So rather than it being a seven on the CentOS and RHEL, it's going to uh, Oracle Linux eight. Uh, and we did some research on that, and this, now we get into the questions. So uh, Oracle Linux eight does support and will support security updates for Python 3 and Python 2. From what I can see from Oracle's documentation, and if you've ever looked at Oracle's uh, documentation site, you're never quite sure if you're looking at the right document. Um, 
but they do say, yeah, that they support uh, Python 2, it'll be Python 2.7, but it will not be installed by default. And what we don't know is whether Illumina is essentially when a, when a system is provisioned, whether Python 2.7 is going to be installed by default or whether it's just going to be Python 3. And our concern there, and I hold my hand up and say, I have essentially contributed uh, to this issue is that over the years, as I say, I've been working with this since uh, 2014, I've written hundreds, uh, well, probably tens of thousands of code application examples, which customers have taken and then evolved into a, a production script, which is Python 2 based which wasn't a problem when Python 2 was installed by the native OS. Now that that may not be the case, uh, then essentially we've been thinking about, okay, what happens to all this Python 2 code, which may be fine or may not. We, we still seek clarification from, um, from Illumina. So before I just jump into my slides and talk about options, does any does anybody know the answer to that? Has anybody had this discussion with Illumina about whether Python two seven is going to be supported on a hosted system? No. Okay. Um, well, I say it's early days, so we don't necessarily have the uh, final uh, answer uh, here. But we did. Uh, let's just go slideshow. Okay. So we did at least sort of brainstorm around sort of uh, options for reacting to the, and I'm saying potential uh, loss of uh, Python uh, 2.7. So uh, I guess a fairly simple one is since 2.7 is going to be supported by the OS, but not installed, then, you know, it's a fairly sort of industry-wide best practice to not use the OS version of Python, but to install it within a virtual environment. So you could install Python 2.7 within a virtual environment and run the code as is and not have to change any code at all. I would say the caveat to that is that you probably need to update the uh, EPPs or automations so that it's now pointing to Python in the, um, in the virtual environment. Uh, I think all of the EPPs and automations I've created over the years. I, I hard coded the path as you know, user bin Python. I guess a workaround might be to create a symbolic link from that to the virtual environment. So that's why I say we'll uh, probably need to. Maybe there's a workaround to that. So option one is keep the code as it is and just run it within a virtual environment. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, option two is to uh, up the existing code and basically keep it largely as is um, and essentially only make changes that would make the code compatible with Python 3, then run it within um, you know, a Python 3 environment. Once again, probably going to need to update the EPPs and the automations that, uh, that point to the OS version of Python. So it's now pointing to Python 3. Um, the third option is to write, rewrite the existing code so that it's compatible with Python 3 and uh, to use the freely available uh, Python library that Shane alluded to. Um, and that typically makes your scripts smaller uh, in terms of since the library does more than, than the very, very basic library that I created at Illumina. Um, so since the library does more, your scripts have to do uh, less. Um, so yeah, rewrite. So it's Python 3 compatible and compatible with the um, what appears to be the sort of industry-wide Python library. And the fourth is an odd one, uh, but I do want to mention this. So rewrite the existing code, porting it to your language of choice. So we have quite a few customers who, you know, they have Python code that they got from the Illumina website, um, but actually they'd rather it wasn't Python because, you know, they have 
um, you know, a preference, be it at the organization or personal preference for something else. And obviously, you know, the, the, the reasons to port it over to a different language and the costs associated with that are quite significant. But if, if Python 2 is going to disappear, this may actually be a good reason to port it over to you, to your, you know, preferred language. So there's a, a sort of couple of options there. I don't know if we've necessarily found them all or figured out all of the nuances, but um, I just wanted to, if people haven't seen that uh, that press release, let them know that we the, the changes are coming in terms of what's supported and then trying to anticipate if Python 2.7 is not installed by default and Illumina has no plans to do so, what can we do uh, as a community sort of uh, around that. All right, I'm going to pause and have a slurp of tea because my mouth is dry. Does any, anybody have any questions or concerns or, or thoughts about the, the OS upgrade or the potential Python uh, conflict? I hope that wasn't. Uh, I hope that was useful, and it wasn't just a, a waste of your time. But I'm I'm more than happy to, uh, I say, throw this open uh, because we never know who's going to attend, and we don't have advance notice of what any questions might be. So we'd like to have a couple of topics just so there's not. A, an awkward... I do. This is Tim. I, I got a question. Um, yeah. With the, or the you know, them. Well, the Python issue and, and the, the the OS uh, change. You said uh, when you thought we were just going to stay on premise that we would not have a problem with that. Um, with when when Illumina says they're not going to support that anymore, why why would why would that not affect us as well if we stayed on premise? Oh, sorry, perhaps I wasn't clear. What I mean was if, if you're on 6.2 and you want to run 6.2 on uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 rather than uh, Oracle Linux 8, that then that's fine. So it, it's more around the OS. So if you're on premise, as long as you're using an OS which is compatible, then the fact that uh, Illumina's hosted OS is going to be Oracle Linux 8, shouldn't concern you. So that's that's what I meant by you You won't have a problem. Is it, are they also going to stick with progress? Is their only database going forward that they're going to support? Like um, they said they were going to give up support for Oracle, if especially if we went hosted. Um, yeah, since I, Oracle's involved, you know, what's, do you know what the deal is? Yeah, I'm going to defer to Catherine on that because she follows these things a lot more than I do. Okay. So uh, the Oracle Linux is is free, um, although if you wanted to pay Larry Ellison some money to use it, I'm sure he would accept, um, versus the Oracle database, which is definitely not free. Um, so uh, I think 5.2 was the last version that uh, Illumina uh, will support um, Clarity running on, on Oracle. Um, there was some code uh, specifically written to handle the Oracle 19C uh, version um, as a jump from the 12. Um, so I also wondered about the Oracle connection, but really all that's happening is that they're, they're just uh, choosing to go with another free uh, version of an OS that that will be compatible with their product. Um, okay, so it has nothing to do with the database then? No, no, nothing okay. at all. Okay, thank you. Sure. I think they're at uh, Postgres 12.7 or, no, 9, no, 12, 12 something. They, yeah. they, they just keep moving it up every time. Um, mm -hmm. They don't make a big deal about it usually. It just, it's kind of like a... Mm -hmm. A postscript note on the release notes every once in a while. Um, but that but is, is it fair to say that we don't know Illumina's plans on support of Oracle as a database? 
I haven't seen anything uh, specific that talks about um, looking at it again. Um, all I know is that uh, when 5.2 came out, there was kind of the, the basic statement that that was going to be the last version that Clarity um, could run on Oracle. Um, That's what I heard. That, yeah, at that time. Like, um, uh, you know, it, it seems like they're taking a, a really... Um, a different approach to clarity now at the at one point it was kind of um let's let's just keep it um coming along and and now it feels like they're putting a great deal of effort into expanding the product um so i'm i'm not going to close the door on them actually considering putting it back on oracle but um i think it would have to be well worth their while there were very few customers to begin with who were on oracle so i don't know if they think the the bang for the buck would be there. Uh, so, in your in your um, yep. the, with the your customer base, are you seeing most people on on Postgres uh, yeah. versus anything else? Well, definitely, there's very few choices. Um, so, the Postgres is is by and away by by far the. The predominant one. I mean, the only reason I know about um, other ones is from my life at Illumina. Really, I don't work with any. I don't work with any customers now who've got an Oracle database. Uh, yeah. Tim and Danine are 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 well, on sheep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Currently, with with the um, with the on-premise infrastructure. Yeah, um, I remember that. Yeah, and I I haven't used you know the the latest version of Oracle, so I'm probably going back to you know. Uh, Oracle 12. Um, there was never really much performance difference uh, between the two. Uh, like you would never say, oh, you know, use Oracle because it's much faster. Okay. Uh, or at least not, not in this. So it, it um, and the schema is pretty much the same, other than the fact that, you know, in Oracle, uh, you need to specify uh, string lengths for fields, whereas essentially in Postgres, the string lengths are, I mean, not infinite, but, you know, are unbounded uh, in that regard. But in terms of the relationships and, and the actual schema, other than field types, that they are absolutely the same. So I think Illumina sees it as there isn't a compelling reason to support Oracle, given that Postgres essentially does the same thing um, and is, uh, you know, is, is free. That might be a bit misguided because... Um, you know, particularly sort of U.S. government. Um, you know, they've they've typically made a decision to support one platform or another, and it might be that they've decided institutionally that we are, you know, we are an Oracle facility and we need to run Oracle. So, essentially, saying that Postgres does the same thing is free doesn't. It's a moot point if you've already made that architectural decision to support Oracle. So. I'm kind of interested to see how this one plays out. And then there's, you know, with, with Microsoft uh, and Azure, I think that SQL Server is in, a, is, is in a much stronger place than it ever was. And I, you know, I don't know if they have uh, any plans to support that. But Shane, I'm not asking for insider knowledge, but is this worth adding it to the agenda for the next partner meeting? Yeah, I can definitely bring it up. Definitely. I'll, I'll pose that question. I can even fire firing off an email and uh, we can put it in the notes for this meeting once we upload the video if I get any meaningful response um, or anything that we can share publicly. There is another factor which plays into the decision to what you were saying Mark about um, supporting Oracle or having an Oracle shop which is that um, there are some um, institutions uh, that actually have uh, a requirement as part of their accreditation to only use quote unquote supported software. And so Postgres doesn't typically fall into that bucket, uh, whereas Oracle would. So that if they have to meet that criteria, then they're kind of stuck. Um, even without it being a, a business decision, it's kind of a, an accreditation uh, requirement. Yeah. And I, you know, one of my, I'm not going to mention the name, but uh, one of my customers is definitely a, a Microsoft shop mm. uh, and, you know, essentially had to sort of jump through hoops in order to, you know, to, to, to make this work on the Azure uh, cloud. 
Um, okay, but yeah, we've probably talked about that enough. Do we want to talk about advanced search? Because I think that's pretty so, cool. Yep, we can do that. Okay, so I've got it uh, running, uh, six one running on um, a VM here. I'll just uh, share, very carefully share my screen, <laughs> make sure I'm sharing the right place. While Catherine's doing that, just to sort of loop, loop people in. So advanced search was something that was in Clarity 4 and earlier, and essentially it disappeared from Clarity 5. And it's it's now back in Clarity 6. So if you've only ever experienced Clarity 5, then um, then yeah, advanced search is uh, is going to give you well uh, clues in the name uh, many more advanced options for finding things. And the UI is broadly the same as it was uh, in Clarity 4 in the operations interface. Yeah, so um, obviously this is the lab view page. Um, if you need me to bump up the volume on how big the screen looks, just uh, put your hands up or, or shout out. Um, so you still have all of the um, the options under the regular search, this the magnifying glass over here. Although in the release notes for Clarity 6.1, they do say that you can no longer um, uh, search on container UDFs or project UDFs, you would actually have to use advanced search in order to accomplish that. Um, so I've got a few samples sitting in here, um, not very many because it doesn't really matter what data comes back, the, the object is to show you what this looks like. So um, this is the search screen, it comes with a disclaimer that because of delays in indexing, you may not get the most recent data until it's had a chance to be indexed. I've asked if there's a time on that, and uh, they don't. They don't. They don't give me that. So um, that that would be something that you'd want to validate in your own system: is how long do you have to wait before the advanced search actually comes back with your data? So uh, over here, I've got three saved searches, but building one is super easy. Uh, so you get your choice of starting from these various um, points. So we'll just start with a sample, and then I can add a criteria. So I can um, say I want to find a sample. Uh, they give you a list of every single UDF that's in the system, regardless of whether it's associated with a sample, a container project, all of them are listed. So this is a big, long list because I um, imported the DNA initial QC, which of course has got a gazillion measurement UDFs because of all the QC. So I'm just going to go whipping down to the end here. Um, and I can be saying, okay, um, well, I want um, a, a sample type of something, or I want the sample name possibly to have, you know, the letter, the string KK in it. Um, I've got options for the matching criteria. So contains, does not contain, is exactly, is not, um, is set and is not set is lovely because of course that's null or not null. Um, and that can be very handy to, to find things. Next step is just to hit the search button. So it goes away and it comes back with a, your data set. Um, and uh, uh, just going to scroll down here a bit. Um, you can see that it's um, giving me 99 pages, um, and so, uh, sorry, 99 results and, and over five pages. Um, and so I can I can move through each of those pages um, to show you what's actually coming up on the screen is a fantastic list of um, columns. And um, these come every time. So all of these particular um, what do we call built-in UDFs plus any of the ones that you configure on the system, they are actually listed here. And I, I know I'm going really quick, but I want to get over to the right here because this is where the the, the global UDFs are. So um, there's, and probably the, the step ones as well. So they've been um, condensed into just these one columns for each of the groups. I can expand them um, so that they are visible on the screen. But you know this is getting close to useless at this point because so much of the data is not visible. Uh, so they've got a download feature. And when you download, then it creates a, a CSV file. And obviously, if you um, open that up, I don't know that that's the one. Um, 
then you've got the again the whole range of all the fields and then regardless of whether there's any data in those udfs or not the column is listed so um you can start to play with it in excel which is is nice um they it's it tells you for each of the udfs um, whether it's a derived sample a measurement a project a container so that you know actually what you're looking at um so it's uh it's quick that's for sure um it it is a run it on demand kind of thing it, it's not something that you can launch from a script uh but hopefully they will do that and make it an endpoint so that you can build a query and then you know fire it from the middle of a step or something like that. Um, you can add more criteria. Uh, you can choose from the other um, groups. Uh, you can say, oh, well, I, I want the name of the project to have, I don't know, tests in it. And that can be an and or an or. Um, you can, uh, where the sample has got, let's see if you can find one of the sample UDFs. Hmm. Here we go. I think if I do this, no, it's not gonna. Hmm. Okay. Um, then I can say measurement UDF is, I don't know, less than or equal to, is set, is not set. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, you can you can't save the query until you've searched. So that didn't come back with anything. Uh, so we'll get rid of that criteria. But you could do um, grouping uh, if you did have th three criteria. Um, then we can say the sample name also contains. Where is it? Here, let's say one, two, three. Um, and so we can search that. I can save my query. So it'll say, okay, how do you want to name it? Uh, test query uh, one. So that's saved. Um, I like the grouping controls again. It's going one and two and three. That's pretty easy. If I change this one to an or, then where do I want my brackets? Uh, so then I can uh, say, okay, well, uh, these two guys. I want to group them and now you get the the different levels of complexity so they they've provided what i feel is a really nice first start to advanced searching so long as it's you know i don't think we're going to be able to do a turnaround time calculation here but you should be able to download the data that you're looking for if you've been capturing it in udfs or if it's already in some of the built-in fields nice um the last I was just going to say there are some, you know, right now, if you've got a, particularly for operational data, you know, how many samples did we process this month and you need to report on that yeah. rather than actually building a bespoke report that uses the API or the database, it probably makes sense to uh, try and get as, as close as you can with this report or rather with this advanced search, save it because you would still need to run it manually you know, each the, the the day before each operational meeting, etc. Uh, you might need to do some uh, tidy up in uh, Excel because, as Catherine has shown, like it, it brings pretty much everything it knows about every entity. You might want to uh, to filter those, you know, and add an aggregation on if you're really just after a count. Yeah. Um, but... So we would. So here's a question for you. So can you you can export the data, but yeah. can you? Can it show the query so that we can like the actual behind the oh, yeah. query because we use reporting, you know, so that because we automatically email reports. Yeah. So is that something that is possible with this? I don't not... think it's in this version. No. Okay. No. No. But uh Deline, Deline, I, I love the idea. Mm, yeah. Um, it's well worth uh, sending um, an email to uh, tech supported Illumina, putting Clarity Lamb's advanced search in the subject and then saying, please, could you put this on the feature request list? Because um, uh, the the development group, they they will pay attention to what it is the users are asking for. 
how much attention is up to the product manager, of course, but um, any ideas that can come in from the users are obviously going to take um, a look at. Yeah, th there's a strange irony that even though we're partners, anything from a paying customer gets, a, gets yeah much higher priority than an underpaying partner. So uh, essentially, they get tired of hearing from us. But if you ask the very same question, then it immediately goes in with a much higher priority. It's not to get not to say that you know it'll be in the next version. I don't want to set any expectations, but it paying customers their 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 messages get a lot further up the organizational chain than a, a non-paying partner. Yeah. Okay. The other thing to note is that these queries that I'm building here, if I were sharing this instance with Mark and he were able to log into this instance as a new user, he wouldn't see these queries here. So it's not it's not being saved at the server level. It's being saved at a basically a user level. Um, but I can share my queries with Mark. So I could take uh, this test query 1.1, which is what's showing on the screen here, and I could uh, click on the share and it'll download this text file. Now, of course, we're all very curious. What does this look like? It looks like <laughs> so, not helpful, but um, I can send it over to Mark and he can load it on his system. And uh, he would he would basically have, you know, this, this open system and uh, he would import the query. So right now it's just been saved to my downloads. So I will call that up and um, we can see that here's the, the query that I've um, brought in. I'm just going to make a copy of it because, you know, just want to make sure. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so duplicate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So now we've got copy. So I, I'll import copy as if it was one that Mark shared with me. And so I would click on this import query button. I would go to my downloads um, and I would would open up that text file that he sent. And here is well, my query, but his query. Um, and then it's not it's not part of this list yet. Right. I don't have one called copy. So I actually have to run it as a search. And then I get the chance to save it. And then I can save it as, you know, uh, dot two or something like that. Um, and then it becomes part of the list over on the side. But this is very user uh, specific. It's not across the the instance itself. But in the, um, sorry, Deneen, I'm putting words in your mouth. But for example, if Deneen and her colleagues built a query on behalf of their customers who are the labs, it's the each individu individual user would have to import it, but they would at least be working with the same thing and they can call it whatever they wish. Okay, I, I didn't actually know that you could do that. Yeah. Now, the one little gotcha um, is that if you do a clear all and then ask for that imported query, nothing happens here. So I've told, I've told Clarity support team this. Uh, you actually have to click on an original one that you built, and then you can click on the one that you imported. So I've huh. made a little movie of it. I've sent it off to them. <laughs> Hopefully they put it on their bug list because it's a little annoying to have to click somewhere else before you get what you want. Um, but uh, any any questions? Anybody wants to see any of the things that are on any of the lists? Okay. Um, they do have this little um, icon here that lets you see all of the fields that are and are not being shown. Um, however, it it kind of only works um, for every time you hit search. So um, I've asked them to make that a little bit more friendly uh, because I have approximately 200 UDFs here. And if I only wanted to quote unquote see uh, 50 of them, I'd have to have to do like 200 clicks every time I ran the query to to make the sample, the, the list smaller, which for my so own purposes, I would just download it into Excel and then deal with the columns there. Yeah, I, I was going to suggest the same thing, but I guess if you if you want to see this in screen, actually mm. scrolling from left to right, that might be uh, okay. That I could see but that it that doesn't save what you chose. That's the problem, right? Yeah, it doesn't save your selection globally. Okay, but it, I mean this this so the, the, this 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 might not be the perfect search mechanism that I you know I could dream of, but I would say that. It, it does actually open up a lot more structured searches than than the non-advanced search. And I 
I can immediately think of people that would find this useful. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, it's. I think it's a great advance for them to have included it in the product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They also um, did a read-only role now. So a lot of users been asking, you know, can I just have a permission that allows my people to go in there, but they can't change anything. Um, they can't edit anything. And that up until 6.1, uh, that has not been um, available, but it is now to have a read-only um, permission. So that's good. Do we know whether read-only users count against the license number? asking for a friend i don't i don't it's a good question maybe shane can put that on his list <laughs> um please add it on um that's it we should probably open the floor um uh there might be a couple of people that have some very specific questions something that they want help with um it uh, in recognition that some of um some of these folks are calling in from different time zones over in europe um maybe kenneth or Emil, uh, did you guys have any specific questions, anything that you need help with? Um, so I think Mark mentioned in the beginning about the, uh, this is just a particular issue, the not being able to click the OK button uh, via the API, right? I think we'd like to see the, uh, I guess, the workaround for that. You actually encountered a, a particular uh, error this week. so. Uh, that would be really nice to have. So I think what um, I think what might have been used, I'm not sure if it was the final thing, is that the um, EPP has a, um, a, a minus T parameter. Um, and so what uh, the workflow test I think does is it picks up the EPP and it kind of overwrites it and changes that minus T from um, a false to a true. And then runs the EPP and then puts it back the way it was. And so they you can get around the um, the pop-up if the minus T is equal to true. Oh, so it's just it. modifying what kind of error it's showing, I guess. Yes. Yeah, doing that. Yeah. Okay. So they this this is related to the lab logic toolkit. Um so uh there are other scripts, of course, that may produce a pop-up. Um, and I say we we th th this isn't perfect th the workaround, but for lab logic toolkits, particularly for the one which is a uh, change workflow, that always gives you a pop up because it tells you which samples went where, even if no samples went anywhere. Um, so yeah, I I can document this. I can send it out. We'll my, 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 I'll make sure it gets to Shane, which means it gets to you. Um, but yeah, the minus T parameter, it's a bit confusing. In the documentation, it's referred to as a test, I think. And I and I think that's actually, well, that, that's not how I remember it from when we were at Genealogics. So that's to tell the script if it was triggered from a button, in which case write the outputs from the script into the into the screen, or it's triggered from a screen transition, in which case you get the dialog box. Um, so essentially, we're just kind of perverting the use of that and saying, okay, well, it, it is actually triggered from a screen transition, but for for testing purposes, just pretend it was triggered from a button, and then you don't get the pop up. But yeah, I'm more than happy to uh, to write a, a couple of paragraphs of that. And I say it's 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 a bit confusing in the official documentation because they the the way they name it and define it is not how I remember it being designed. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Cool. Well, hope that helps. Hope that helps. Um, Kenneth, I, I know you're also in um over in Europe. Uh, did you have any questions? Yes, uh, it's, it's more like a comment. So in the beginning, you said, Mark, that you were not able to test if a step contained controls. Was that right? Yes. So there is no there's no API essentially around the ice bucket. So one th so some things that you can't do programmatically are uh, remove controls uh, from an ice bucket. You can remove them, right? Yes. Okay, yeah, because we have tests where we add controls in the ice bucket and then run and test. Okay. okay. Yeah, other, other things are, um, so the setting the number of replicates, um, that technically happens as part of the ice bucket. But we, mm -hmm. we've got a workaround for that as well. Yeah. But there's, I think there's one part 
I think if you've got, Catherine, please correct me if I'm wrong, and I'll follow up on this. I think if you've got a pooling step and you're pooling into tubes, there's one part of that process which doesn't have an API. And I think in the past, Semaphore is essentially that the best we could do was to run the tests to that point and then unfortunately publish a URI as part of the output of the screen that says you need to go here and you need to click you know, the next button and then the test will resume. So there's a, there's a couple of places in Clarity which are opaque or invisible to the mm -hmm. API. And th the best we can do is try and work around those. It's not, it's far from ideal. We do have tests where we actually pool samples uh, advance to the next, uh, what do you call it, step. And that seems to work. So I, I, I think it depends upon the output container. So if okay. it's, I think it's different if it's a if it's a multi well container versus a single well container. That might be, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a screen that shows up that's called arrange tubes, and there's you can't do anything with that screen. Okay. Yeah. It, it's rare. We hardly ever see it because that's not how customers want to run their steps. Okay. Yeah. So it's I, I don't want to say I say the workflow tests are perfect. Um, I say if if you personally, you know, you're building workflow tests and you get stuck and and you um you know you can't do something, please drop us a line. It's uh, you know, mm -hmm. it, it could be that we've we've have a workaround for that. Um or um, you know, or we can work on it together. But yeah, more than more than happy to I, you know, I'm I'm always happy to take a problem. I might not have the solution, but I, I'd rather know about it than not. <laughs> Uh, I can tell you that we, we don't use your your uh, we call uh, Python code. We use our own Python code where we have some testing, and we also make the test before we actually develop them. Oh, okay. So okay. we write them first, and then we do the development. Hmm. Interesting. Is your library open source, or is it something that you're willing to share, or is that not appropriate? Uh, I can maybe show how it looks just a moment. So this is feature testing. This is how uh, how our test looks like, uh, and you can see we actually add control there. So this is a uh, behavior driven development. We just write these tests. Yeah. Uh, even the following samples, uh, we add the controls, drops and blank order, and then we send the, to the stage drops and so on. It's that it's that's how we write. And so we write them first, and then we do the development later. Okay, that that's neat. So I, I I just saw, I think, from your command line. So you're at uh, MoMA? Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't appreciate that. I've I've visited you many times when I was at Genealogics and Illumina. Okay. Is, is Katya still there? She's still there. Okay. Say hi to Katya. I will. <laughs> okay. That's that's neat. Mm -hmm. That's neat. Yeah, if 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 it's appropriate uh, to share that uh, with the community, uh, please let us know. Because as I say, we have a library, but we don't by any means uh, say that it's it's the best. And if yeah, if it's appropriate to but share, this is, more, yeah. than, more than happy. This is built on our library, but I think you can I can probably share the code where this is uh, these feature tests are. I don't think that's a problem. Okay, well, so I, I don't don't want to pressure you. I'm, it's just a case of you know because uh, customers will ask us. You know what? What are the options? Obviously, yeah. we give them our own option, but I'd like yeah. to be able to give them more rather than saying there's only one. I would definitely recommend to uh, uh, do behavior-driven development because it's very easy to write these tests and people understand them. So you can have a laboratory technician write these tests if you want, and then you can do some coding later. Yeah, I really like the, the I really like the natural language aspect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what framework is that on? Is it Lettuce or Allo? It is a, it's Python based. It's a, it's a library called Behave we are using. Oh, okay. Oh, and there's something similar uh, 
through um, Lettuce uh, for Python 2.7, I think. And then um, our lab is using Allo right now, but it looks very similar to this. Yeah, and that's because it's a, it's a way of doing it that is known as a Gherking, so yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to be hitting Google straight after this meeting. Actually, <laughs> yeah. Straight after my next meeting. Yeah. But it's very easy to write tests, and that's why it's also easy to write them uh, to begin with and then do the development later. And then okay. when all is green, then it's working. So I imagine you could write up your JIRA tickets with this and then uh, then go into development, put this into your tests. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. cool. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Problem. And uh, Barbara, if you have something that you're willing to share, we'd love to see that too. Although I think we all need to go to our next meetings, but um, just contact Shane. That'd be great. I don't have anything to share at the moment, but I do have a question. Okay. So um, our lab is currently using Clarity 4.3. So mm -hmm. we're really behind because we're um, uh, using on-premise. Yep. Yeah. Um, and we've noticed that with the newer instances of Clarity um, that don't have ops, uh, there isn't an easy way to rename a container for a completed step. <laughs> so I'm just wondering what you guys have come up with as a workaround for that. Yeah, it's the, I, I don't know if this is the best name. We, internally, we call this a utility step. And so the, I guess that the, the only trick to it is that, uh, cause you, for to be able to run a step, you need an input, but the input can be a control sample. So most customers will have a section of utility steps for exactly this kind of thing. And there might be one called rename a container. And so you start running it on a control, but then you just essentially use clarity and the step UDFs as a form. So you can say, you know, provide the old name, provide the new name, click a button that will trigger this. And then what you do with the output, whether it's attached to the step or just displayed in a multi-line text field. But the, the, the general pattern is that, yeah, there's a bunch of things like that. And where it gets really important is if you're using Illumina's sequencing integrations, if you forget to name the flow cell or you misname the flow cell, then that data is never going to be uh, collected by the integration. So most people have a bunch of utility steps uh, uh, with one of them is renaming a container. One of them is re-indexing a sample. So from the submitted sample onwards, uh, if particularly if you're taking in, you know, index libraries and essentially, you know, you, you do the sequencing and you, you, you don't see the index at all. And you realize it's because you were given bad information at the beginning, being able to run a utility step and re-index that particular sample uh, and its descendants and then the data gets picked up. And uh, yeah, there's quite a few of them, but that, that pattern of, of running a step on a control such that you can run it whenever you need, you know, essentially outside of the workflow uh, is a good one. And that's how we've essentially got around the fact that, yeah, the operations interface allowed you to do some things which the Clarity GUI didn't out of the box. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks. That helps. Um, the, the, the amusing part about that is that um, I don't know who Mark was collaborating with at the time, but they've they've chosen the name of this uh, control to start these utility steps oh, yeah. as a slot machine token. So you dump the token into the step and you get to run it to do whatever you want. <laughs> I'm not sure who that was. I've been using that. I, I've adopted that myself as the best practice, but. Yeah, because you do have this odd control, which is not a scientific control. It's just essentially a, a, a step starter. Yeah. And uh, Barbara, as, as you probably heard, you know, 15 times, reach out to us more than happy to uh, to give you information on that if, uh, if, if what I've said is not sufficient. Thanks so much. Oh, I think Tatiana just left. I was just going to open the yes, floor. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no problem. Um, I think... I think unless Tim, did you have any uh, really um, pressing questions right now? I did not. Okay. This is, I find this very useful to, to um, hear, you know, some of the nuances of the new new releases and some of the information you provided has been very beneficial. And I thank Thanks. you for having this. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, listen, um, 
thank you to everyone who attended. Um, I am going to be posting a copy of the recording and I'll be sending it out and you can find it on our YouTube channel. Um, the next office hour session will probably be in August. So if um, anybody here or anybody uh, watching the recording has any questions, please send them, send them through to me. Uh, my email address is shane.ryan at 74solutions.ca or .com. And um, we'll, um, we'll queue them up for the next office hour session. And we really look forward to seeing you folks again. And we really thank everybody who attended, everybody who's going to be watching this. And it's been great. And thanks. Thanks, thanks for everything. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.